I had many sleepless, sleepless nights just wondering what is happening because I still do not understand what has happened. Tonight, David Frost and the Shah of Iran. It has been exactly a year and a day since the Shah of Iran went into exile. It has been 75 days since the Americans at the U.S. Embassy were taken hostage. They are still being held as ransom for the return of the Shah to face charges of mass murder and corruption. The Shah of Iran has granted an exclusive interview to British journalist David Frost on the island of Contadora in the Republic of Panama. ABC News arranged to broadcast portions of that extensive interview. We want to make it clear that the Shah received no money for the interview and that he imposed no ground rules or restrictions. ABC News has full editorial control for our broadcast. We thought it was important to broadcast the voice at the center of the controversy, the man for whose return the hostages are being held, who would not speak until now, and now says he will not give another interview. David Frost is in our ABC newsroom in Los Angeles. Uh, David, first of all, what was your main objective in seeking this interview? Two, I think, Hugh, really. First of all, to find how he'd respond to that torrent of charges you mentioned, his side of the story, as it were. And secondly, to try and provide a sort of up-to-date insight into the man himself, if we possibly could. Of course, we started with the headlines, and you'll notice in the first answer that although the Shah's English is very good, it's his third language, but it's very, very good, nevertheless, at one point, he pronounces one word where he says important when he means impotent, or it sounds that way, and he meant impotent. That was when I asked him a question in the current headlines, what his reaction was to the proposal for some form of UN tribunal to judge him. I asked him for his reaction. Well, my reaction would be that when they are absolutely important to do something against the country, then and uh, look what is happening. Look what is happening. If in those days people were tried, first instance, second instance, then convicted, then eventually uh, shot, except those who really attempted on my own life or did something against me. Now they are just shot without trial. I think that now the official number is over 700. God knows how many have been liquidated. How many people are in jail today? One and a half million people, Iranians, have left the country. Not only the rich people, but the best brains of the country, the best minds of the country. They have all left. Everybody who can leave the country is leaving the country. I'm still surprised, I can't still accept that the Iranian with their mentality, with their intelligence would willingly uh, commit harakiri and go back uh, at least 1500 years. Shah of Iran lays some of the blame for his downfall on American oil companies when his talk with David Frost continues right after this. When powerful men rule, their hold on the reins of government seem unchallengeable. And when they suddenly are toppled and fall from power, there is surprise and shock and a lot of questions and lots of blame. David, the Shah places some blame for his exile on the island of Contadora in the Republic of Panama and for his overthrow on American interests. Isn't that right? Yes, he does, Hugh. Although he admits there were errors of his own making, Whenever he turns to the subject of the final days, there's that continuing theme of either betrayal or, as here, conspiracy. Two years before the changes in my country, we heard from two different sources connected with the oil companies that the regime when Iran would change. And for the last year, the consortium never seriously discussed their plan to purchase our oil. And what was their purpose in doing that, do you think? 
it's just in imagination we believe that there was a plan that there must be less oil offered to the world market in order to make the price of oil go up one country should have been the the one chosen for the sacrifice Iran was producing 5,600,000 barrels per day so in order to have a shortage of oil in order to make the prices go up with what I have heard about these two people connected with two oil companies and the consortium never really starting serious talk about placing in order to buy our oil so it seems that the chosen country to drop its production of oil would have been mine two people from what oil companies? well I'm not naming them really because uh, that would be something else but from two different companies two different countries? two different companies but from which country? if you don't well, name the they company. happen to be an, an American company had you done anything that would have given the oil consortium a reason to be angry with you? When they were dragging their feet for almost one year and never signing a firm contract for our oil, then uh, I was starting to ask myself, uh, these people who were so eager to place an order for our oil or to have our oil at their disposal how is it that they uh, look so disinterested so that you think that when they gave you the advice to uh, pull back and produce a bit less oil it wasn't because your oil would run out i.e. not in your interest so much as in the interests of the profits of others uh, to that extent yes during the final days um, during that period um, leading up to Christmas and to January so what could the United States have done to help you do you think? well nothing I think that instead of the US and the UK coming out so strongly with words by saying that we are 100% behind the Shah we support him and this and that if they had just kept quiet from the beginning and not mixed into our affairs that would have been uh, probably the best thing um, is there anything that uh, the United States or Britain could have positively done that you would have regarded as mm -hmm. assistance? not in the end, no not in the end not after not after the maybe a two or three months uh, the first two or three months of 1978 up until then what could they have done? after the situation and stop giving advice the advice was not helpful it was confusing you mean? Well, the results are here, unless uh, the world is satisfied with what is going on in Iran. So then the advice were wonderful. If not, that's a different matter. From your own point of view, you'd had a strong feeling of American support from president to president for years, really. Oh, yes, surely. Um, did you feel as secure in, in the beginning of 1978? The assurances were there. What can be done now, do you think? Would, would the security be assisted by the Americans establishing some sort of physical presence? I mean, in security the, where? In the, in the Gulf or the Somali area or... 
Yes. How many? How many? As I said, we would have had 760,000 first class troops. And you need numbers of that size. You're saying, I mean, it's no good having a detachment of a hundred or a thousand. Now, the day of uh, a gunboat is over. Do you now think that it was uh, a great mistake to uh, suppose that uh, Khomeini be moved from, from Iraq in the sense that that may be more available to the world's press at the crucial time in October? I think that uh, the government inadvertently proposed something like this. And then we, when we studied it, we saw that uh, this would be a mistake. <clears throat> then we tried to stop it. And it was too late. Before you exiled them, did people advise you to go further and execute them? No, I, I don't remember that. Maybe some people have said, well, try him. But uh, I think, uh, I, I, I still think that the best policy with uh, 30 people is when uh, it becomes absolutely impossible to deal with them is just to ask them politely to take a trip on a one-way ticket. Well, this time it was, it was not a one-way way ticket. Do you think that Mr. Khomeini, an educated a uh, person, if you ask him if uh, there is protein in, uh, uh, I don't know, in oats or not, he could not tell you about it. He could have planned all this, masterminded all this, set up all the organization. Surely not. Who do you think did? Well, that's the question. Do you think you know the answer? Not precisely, I don't, I know about the people who were surrounding him. You did, I know, yes. Where did they come from, you know? Well, the two main people in those days, at least uh, on the surface, were PSD and uh, Hort Zardes, uh, with a part that we all know. They were educated in America, you know. But not only that, PSD was an American citizen, or they was thrown out of Georgetown University because he was incapable of studying. And many people say that first he was a CIA agent and then a KGB agent. Really? Between the period September 7th, which was the day of realization, you said, when you realized that uh, the love of your people was not the same as it was, or whatever. Uh, at least some of my people. And the period when you decided to leave. Um, between those two periods, was there a time when you privately said to yourself, um, I may have to leave before anyone suggested it to you? I may not win this battle. <laughs> between September 7th and uh, January 16th. Well, maybe not exactly in this uh, concept, but uh, I had many sleepless, sleepless nights just wondering what is happening. Because I think that I do not understand what has happened. Question, what is going on? It was not uh, so much a question that I was thinking that it was time to go. I was uh, rather thinking that uh, you know, like an end, something. 
without thinking of going, you think you may be this is the end of an era. Or something. Of you, of an era, or, or something. During the final days of your rule, and uh, the period after thereafter, uh, General Robert Heiser, who was second in command to Al Hayes at uh, NATO, visited Iran on a mission that really remained sad in this team. We was in this to you because he didn't notify you, I don't think, of his arrival. And indeed, uh, one of your colleagues, uh, General Rabbi, said that, said that General Heiser, General Heiser threw the emperor out of the country like a dead man. What was it all about? Well, to the extent that I will permit myself to be expressive is that I can say that for the first two days, I don't remember exactly how many days, I did not even know of his presence there. Uh, in the past he was coming and going, but each time it was announced months ahead and obviously the first thing was to have an audience with me. I saw him only once when he accompanied the American ambassador to come and inquire about the date of my departure and even the hour of my departure. That's what I discussed with General Heiser. But uh, one or two days before I left the country, uh, my then chief of staff told me that General Heiser wanted him to meet with Mr. Bagadan the then chief of staff being General Karabaldi, who was former uh, commander of the gendarmerie and then former minister of the interior. But what have you heard since about what uh, General Heiser did? I, I have no report from General Karabaldi, but what I know is General Karabaldi and his friend General Padu and that is a tragedy that I don't know if even Homer could describe or Shakespeare. I can't anyway. Just I lose my old uh, friend who before that he was brought up among our families and he was in Loro with me and then after that all the time with me and these two people have not been touched by the revolution. How could that be explained? And what are they doing today in Iran? God knows. There are many rumors, obviously, but they have been absolutely untouched. And the rumor that you said Homer, which I think is a very good choice about General Fadis, having been your close friend, friend from in such a young age and having worked with you so much that he heads or consults with the uh, current government's uh, secret service organization and the other much more homeric rumor is that he masterminded the murder of your nephew i have heard that <clears throat> i don't want to believe it but this is what i have heard repeatedly and so what do you feel about him now? In my inner heart, I hope it's not true. Because it would be so dirty, so vile, so disgusting, that one would uh, have uh, looking to the humanity a little hesitation of uh, believing into anything. Do you ever wish that you had stayed and died fighting in the street? Well, if I was not a king, surely I would have done that. But because you were a king, you felt 
what to protect. Your son that you should leave? Or? That's uh, one thing. The other thing is that a crown, a throne, could not be based on as a not too very solid foundation of blood. From the beginning, always I was begging and pleading with my people, don't kill, don't kill, please don't kill. And uh, that's when uh, the army started to teach their people how to aim at the lower part of the body and how to use rubber uh, bullets and those things. Because we have never thought of, uh, of that before, we never had the occasion of meeting such an emergency. What were the last words you said as you left? Well, I didn't make any dramatic gesture uh, like some of uh, either contemporaries or before in history. I was so terribly shocked and under the impression of all these big, strong officers sobbing like children. That uh, I was uh, speechless, I was voiceless. At the same time, when you arrived in Egypt, that people had turned out in, in their millions in the streets to cheer. Did you think then what a fickle, ungrateful people they will cheer my departure, they will cheer the Ayatollah or whoever, but tomorrow they will cheer somebody else? <coughs> well, it was not in Egypt, it was a little later on. But I remember having read somewhere that ingratitude is the prerogative of the people. You at the moment hadn't abdicated it, in fact, have you? Abdicate, that does not exist. In our vocabulary, it does not exist. I mean, in the vocabulary of a king does not exist unless a very, very special circumstances. So you remain, you remain a king, you do not abdicate. Not willingly, I might be the case. Does a king have to agree to be an abdicate, to abdication? Yes, or that yes. Unless he's decapitated. I know you are a socialist, but um, how long do your doctors tell you that you have to live? They did not elaborate on that it is subject, maybe on the opposite. <clears throat> they were saying that there are always new drugs, new medicine, in the same case, people have uh, lived a uh, normal life. But as you mentioned yourself before, I'm not thinking of these things at all. I can only say that, well, I performed my duty until the time that it was assigned to me, and probably that time was over. When I committed, I think, the mistake of changing the arms of our government and precipitate the liberalization program, I uh, wanted to create, as I said, a coalition to form a national government representing all shades, especially the opposition people. I tried very hard, and I worked very hard on that, but uh, it did not come true. And do you think that uh, Mr. Sharif Amami initially at the beginning did, did the right things or not? Well, you can say yes and you can say no, because uh, it was surrendering on all fronts. 
to everyone, opening the jails and uh, giving uh, freedom to all, and at the same time uh, asking for martial law. So it was a mockery. We had uh, officially the martial law, but it was not put into practice. At what point, um, you said yesterday, uh, from September onwards, but was it really from when Sharif Imami was appointed? At what point did you decide to step back? I mean, Sharif Imami's actions were his actions yes. or your actions? No. At, with this government, they started to be on their own completely. He would come and see me, obviously. He would telephone to me. I would telephone to him. But the question of uh, what the system that used to work before was absolutely changed. They would adopt and uh, decide about things that they, they would never even report to me. You ask me why they are concentrating so much against me on a person and accusing me of mass murdering or even money man manipulation, which is very far from my nature. They're adopting this. Nazi-like propaganda is something quite curious. It comes in the picture that uh, the man there now, you see, he doesn't want to hear about the history of our country one day before he came back to Tehran a year ago and took over. He says the history of the country does not exist. There has not been a single good king in the history of Iran. So he thinks that the history of Iran starts with him on uh, whatever it was, February of 1979. That's why they are concentrating so much on me because I was the king. The history of Iran must disappear. With I as a king, with the other kings, with everything that existed before February 1979. A patriot must think of the future. I'm thinking of the year 2000. If we kept our youth and our population out of the orbit of the new technology, how could we be competitive with the rest of the world in the year 2000? Unless we are ready to fall in the category of the fifth or sixth great nations. Now they say that boys of 15 and girls of 13 could marry. Our population explosion is 3.2 already. Soon it will become, I don't know, in the, in the category of uh, 5 to 6 percent. How are they going to feed these mouth, mouses? Especially if uh, what now is making the wheels turn somewhat, that his oil money will be finished. It's only through technology and mastering the science and the future of the world is based on technology and science. And this is only in the Western world that you could find. So the man is not thinking of the country or its future, only about his hatred against me. I'm thinking of the country, of our people, of our future, and he's just want to destroy what I am. That's the difference. And uh, when I tell you, Mr. Frost, that I still cannot understand, I will repeat that again. I still cannot understand what has happened. If you had your time a Shah and Shah over again, those 37 years, what, what would you have done differently? Well, 
Well, now probably I will say a few things because uh, something went wrong, obviously. And uh, in addition of uh, either saying uh, the truth or making uh, yourself excuses and uh, all kind of things to defend yourself against the failures, but uh, probably in addition to all the intrigues from within and without, something has gone wrong. And this is what I think about. Uh, I have recently published a book in which I elaborate on some of these uh, subjects, but I will tell you now that Either we started a little too late, the liberal, liberalization program, or we started a little too early and too fast. Either we should have started it in 1973 instead of 75 or 6, or at a time of crisis, when we were seeing that things were moving in the direction of complete chaos and anarchy, then to take our time, first to reestablish law, order, and uh, uh, the execution of rule, implementation of rule, and then start to liberalize again. It's one of those two things. But I was following my inner instinct. How do you think uh, future generations of Iranians will view your 37 years? The truth and the reality of history could not get, be kept always. Uh, in the shadows, that is impossible. Uh, truth will come out. In any case, sooner or later. And at that point, in 50 years' time, how will future Iranians judge you? 50 years, I hope it will be sooner than that. <laughs> well, whenever I was saying, what, how will your people? after a period, judge you? Well, if they read history, they will see what it was before my father, when it, what it was when I took over, and what it was when I left. Do you feel that uh, your people let you down, or that you let your people down? First of all, when we say the people, we cannot talk about all the people. That's absolutely not true. Now, I can say that the silent majority remains silent. And if I let my people down, it was for the purpose, purposes or purpose that I tried to explain that a king cannot be a dictator and that a throne could not be based on blood. This is my only explanation for what it is uh, worth. Did, did your people let you down, do you think? Well, the majority remains silent. Is the worst thing about being here, thinking of your homeland? Well, here or anywhere outside my country is the same. The question is that you cannot stop thinking about your own country. What do you miss most about it? 
what I miss or what makes me really cry is that we could have been this year, surely by the end of 82, something quite viable. And what are we now? What has it served? The religion? Democracy? Human rights? The rule of the people? And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much.